ages. Richard II is ultimately about the legitimacy of the divine status claimed by kings and one man's realization that that status cannot protect him. This idea is expressed best when the Duchess of Gloucester begs Henry Bolingbroke's father, John of Gaunt, one of the last surviving sons of King Edward III, to revenge the death of her husband and his brother, the Duke of Gloucester. Before we discuss what Gloucester's widow says, this scene is crucial because it keys into one of Shakespeare's sources. Shakespeare never wrote his own stories. His source for the Henriad is Hollinshed's Chronicles and Hall's Unions of Two Noble and Illustrious Families. But he also was reliant on two previous plays, one called Woodstock. Woodstock tells all the background on how Richard II and his flatterers conspire to kill Gloucester. And there was another play, there were two plays on Henry IV and Henry V that were compressed into one play and published as the famous victories of Henry V and all the funny scenes that you're going to see in Henry IV Part 1, 2 and Henry V come from that play as well. So let's look at what the Duchess of Gloucester has to say. Her appeal refers to the sacred nature of kings. Have love in thy old blood no living fire? Edward's seven sons, whereof thou self art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those seven are dried by nature's course, some of those branches by destiny's cut. But Thomas, my dear Lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root is cracked and all the precious liquid spilt, is hacked down and his summer leaves all faded by envy's hand and murder's bloody ax. Oh, gaunt, his blood was thine, that bed, that womb, that metal, that self-mold that fashioned thee made him a man. And though thou slifst and breathed, yet art thou slain in him. Edward III's blood was shared among many brothers. And that sacred blood that came from King Edward III has been spilled. And John of Gaunt must respond with revenge because that blood was shared among himself and his what brother. What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life, the best way is to avenge my Gloucester's death. Heavens is the quarrel. For heaven's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight hath caused his death. The saying is that any complaint about Richard II must go to heaven because in heaven is seated the quarrel. He's saying I can't kill him. The dispute or the fault is in heaven because he is heaven's substitute or heaven's deputy. That is, because Richard II was anointed as king, that means he was ritually smeared by a bishop with an aromatic, scented or perfumed, it was, it's a kind of an oil, right, that was said to come from heaven at his coronation, then his rule is sanctified by God or by heaven. It comes from the Old Testament. King Saul was anointed as the chosen of God. And so all kingships that are related to this anointing with Saul have this idea of God's choosing. In Richard II, the king is kind of conceived of as a priesthood on par with the church. And that's because the king has become an agent of God on earth. Hence, he's God's deputy or a person appointed by God to represent him on earth, just like a deputy is appointed to represent the law. So it was God's deputy that caused Gloucester to be murdered, which was the basis of the play that, that predates Richard II. And if that's so, 
John of Gaunt cannot, because of the king's sacred coronation, kill him. The which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge, for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where, then, alas, may I complain myself? To heaven, the widow's champion to defense. Richard says the same thing when he talks about his own sacred coronation and the anointment when he's surrounded by enemy armies. Not all the water in the rough rude sea... Nah, let me try that again. Not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the bomb from an anointed king. The breath of worldly man cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. Now Gloucester's widow suspects not only Richard for the murder, but also Thomas Mowbray, the Duke of Norfolk. So let's go and review the politics behind the quarrel or dispute that opens the play and the other quarrels that follow from that first quarrel, right? The murder of Gloucester. Just to get some clarity about the history that surrounds this play. Richard II's reign was troubled. He was young. He was seen as both tyrannical and capricious and impulsive and susceptible to the suggestions of his flatterers. In other words, he was susceptible to the flattery of his entourage. Bushy and Baggett are the plays Rosencrantz and Gildersterns. They'll be the victims of their own flattery and their own fawning. And these characters are also characters that you find in the original Richard play, uh, Woodstock. At one point, around 1387, a group of nobles called the Lord's Appellants, these are lords making an appeal, making a legal appeal, were wanted to, wanted to impeach the king's favorites, these flatterers. The main group of Lord Appellants included Gloucester, because he was such an upright man as the Woodstock play shows, but also, now this is history, this is not in the Woodstock play, he was also joined by Mowbray and Bolingbroke. And in Holbrook we find there was a battle where the appellants won, defeating Richard's army that, were, that included the favorites. There was even discussions of deposing Richard. But then Mowbray steps in and would not go for that. And so they turned Richard into a figurehead. Then in 1388, a parliament was held. It's been called, and it's called the Merciless Parliament. All of his favorites were sentenced to death. In the play, those favorites are put to death by Henry. Then the Chronicles say that John of Gaunt, returning from Spain, was able to restore some of the power for Richard, who in turn went after the original Lord's Appellants including having his uncle, Gloucester, murdered. Somehow Mowbray got back into Richard's good graces, while Bolingbroke was protected by his father, John of Gaunt, who had restored Richard to his power. Mowbray became the captain of Calais, a military and financial port in France that was the closest port to England. He also helped arrange the marriage between Richard and the daughter of the French King Charles VI in order to ensure peace, right? Because this takes place during the Hundred Years' War. Richard's father, the Black Prince, was one of the great champions and, and knights of the Hundred Years' War, as was his father, grandfather Edward III. When Gloucester was imprisoned in Calais for this being part of the Lord's Appellants, it was most likely Mowbray who was partly responsible for his murder. Afterwards, Mowbray was made Duke of Norfolk. And then finally, somehow Mowbray and Bolingbroke had a falling out, and that's where the play begins. Where Bolingbroke is accusing Mowbray of corruption at Calais and the murder of Gloucester. And he's gonna prove it that he's speaking the truth by judicial combat or trial by arms. Bolingbroke. Look what I said. My life shall prove it true. That Mowbray hath received 8,000 nobles in name of lendings from your highness's soldiers, 
the which he hath detained for lewd employments, like a false traitor, an injurious villain. Besides, I say, and will in battle prove, or here or elsewhere to the furthest verge that ever was surveyed by English eye, that all the treasons for these eighteen years complotted and contrived in this land fetched from false Mowbray their first head and spring. Further, I say, and further will maintain upon his bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death. Performance is crucial here. What is Richard II's reactions? Is he innocent of this crime, or is he guilty? If he's innocent, then Richard is a Christ-like victim. You have to look at how the actors respond to these accusations. Motivations are never clear in this play. If Richard is guilty, this might explain why he's keen on avoiding this judicial combat that Henry's so keen to prove. Why? Because if judicial combat or single combat or trial by arms is sanctioned by God as his ordained judgment, then what would Richard, so conscious of God's presence and the divinity of his kingship, that Henry would win proving his case that Mowbray's lewd use of money designated for the Calais garrison was in fact payment for the murder of Richard's uncle Gloucester. Remember Mowbray's comment. Mowbray. Then, Bolinbrook, as low as to thy heart through the false passage of thy throat thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Calais dispersed, I to his highness's soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent, for that my sovereign liege was in my debt, upon remainder of a dear account, since last I went to France to fetch his queen. It was a balance Richard owed him. Now what about Mowbray? What are his concerns? His concern is honor. Richard. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Mowbray. Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gauge. My dear, dear lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away, men are but gilded loam or painted clay. A jewel in a ten times bared up chest is a bold spirit in a loyal breast. Mine honor is my life. Both grow in one. Take honor from me, and my life is done. Then, Dear my liege, mine honor, let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Mowbray's appeal is filled with pathos. Is that a sign of his innocence? Or is he being deflective? You can never tell. And performances will tell you by the way he uses and speaks those words. This may also explain why Richard abruptly stops the joust and banishes Mowbray for life. I love Mowbray's description of exile. He's, it's an exile not only from his country, but from his own language. It's very moving. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English, now I must forgo. And now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or a harp, or like a cunning instrument cased up, or being open put into his hands that knows no touch to tune harmony. Within my mouth you have enjailed my tongue, doubly portcullis with my teeth and lips, and dull and feeling bare in ignorance, is made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence, then, but speechless death, which robs my tongue from breathing native breath? So what are Richard's intents? To keep him from talking? Send him away? And yet Henry Bolenbrook, throughout the play, is obsessed with finding out who killed his uncle Gloucester. He even interrogates one of Richard II's favorites, Bagot. Now, Bagot, freely speak thy mind, what thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death, who wrought it with the king, and who performed the bloody office of his timeless end. Bolingbroke is convinced it's the king's doing. But is he also justifying his own questionable seizure of the crown? In the next video, we're going to look at how Henry Bolingbroke questionably seizes the throne. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.